Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar Ice Academy for the date 8th October 2019. These are the list of articles chosen for today's analysis. The link for the handwritten notes and the timestamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the timestamping is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to our first article analysis for the day. This discussion is about the automatic exchange of information framework. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. The news article speaks about the automatic exchange of information framework between India and Switzerland. Now, today's news is that India received the first tranche, which means the first portion of the finance account details of Indians under this framework. So, what is automatic exchange of information or in short AEOI? AEOI is an agreement. It provides for the exchange of non-resident financial account information with the tax authorities in the account holders country of residence. The participating jurisdictions that implement AEOI framework, they send and received pre-agreed information each year without having to send a specific request. Let us understand what these sentences mean. Assume there are two countries. One is country A and one is country B. These two countries have signed an AEOI agreement. Then every year country A will provide the financial account information of account holders from country B those who have account in country A. Then country A will provide the information to the tax authorities belonging to the country B without any specific request. So we can simply say that this agreement allows countries to share account details within themselves. So what is the advantage offered by this AEOI agreement. Just now we saw that the agreed countries share the information of account holders with tax authorities. Now this will bring in more transparency. It will enable governments to recover tax revenue that is lost to non-compliant taxpayers. This will help to detect tax evasion and increase the revenue for the government. How this happens we will see later in our discussion. Then this uh, agreement will further strengthen international efforts to increase transparency, cooperation and accountability among financial institutions and the tax administrations. Finally, the automatic exchange of information framework will increase voluntary disclosures of concealed assets. It will be done by encouraging taxpayers to report all relevant information. Now, in this context, you should also know that the AEOI framework is developed under the Common Reporting Standards or in short CRS. This CRS is a global standard for the automatic exchange of financial account information. It was developed by Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development that is OECD and it has been designed to prevent offshore tax evasion. Offshore tax evasion means an individual or corporation does not report their offshore or foreign income willfully. They do this in order to avoid or evade paying tax in their home country. So, this is called as offshore tax evasion. Now, also remember that OECD is an international intergovernmental organization of 36 countries. It was founded in the year 1961. It aims to stimulate economic progress and world trade. Now, coming to the Indian context, in November 2016, India and Switzerland signed a joint declaration of AEOI in tax matters on a reciprocal basis. This means both countries will share financial account data with each other annually without a specific request for it. As per the declaration, India would receive the first set of data in 2019. Now, based on this only, we have received the first tranche of information. The next exchange of data will take place in September 2020. Now, here you have to note one point. India is one among the 75 countries with which Switzerland has signed the automatic exchange of information framework agreement. So, what makes Switzerland a preferred destination for people across the globe? It is because Switzerland is a tax haven. It means it imposes very low tax on foreign corporations and individuals. Even earlier, as you may have heard, the Swiss bank also offered anonymity to the financial account details. It means those who wanted to evade tax in home country, they protected their money and their identities from their home governments by using anonymous and numbered offshore bank accounts. Numbered accounts means using code or number instead of using name on the transactions. Normally, when we carry out a bank transaction in our country, 
our name will be used uh, whether to transfer a cash or uh, while paying using online mode etc but in these numbered accounts number or code will appear not the name of the person so this helps the individuals to hide their identity from their home country it is because if this money is in their name then the individual has to pay tax on that money or income in their home country but if they go to a country where tax is low and if that country gives numbered accounts then they can easily hide their income and they need not pay tax on that income now this is nothing but accounts to a black money it is because black money not only means the income which has been illegally obtained by a illegal business but it also means the income which is not declared for tax purposes so for people who wish to evade tax in their home countries they go to countries like switzerland mauritius panama etc because these countries are safe places to stack or store their unaccounted money now the secrecy that is the anonymity maintained by the swiss banks are over because of this aeoi agreement now due to the aeoi there are no numbered accounts or at least the account holder details will be shared to the home government of that individual this in turn will help the authorities to calculate the income of the individual and the authorities will be able to impose and collect tax for the same income now let us discuss the news article the news article says that the first set of data from the swiss tax authorities will contain the data of financial accounts that are presently active and also the accounts that were closed during 2018 this means that even those who closed their account in 2018 fearing action from the indian authorities will not be spared and as we all know that the prime minister of india had declared to fight against black money in 2018 2014 so the government of india took several measures to curb black money and money laundering the first step towards this was the introduction of the black money undisclosed foreign income and assets and imposition of tax act of 2015 now this was followed by demonetization in 2016 then two more compliance windows were opened by the government which are income declaration scheme and the pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana we will discuss about these uh, tax and schemes in some other discussion. in some other day now along with these the present transfer of data from switzerland is another significant milestone in the fight against black money that is stashed or stored abroad so with this we have come to the end of this news article discussion the respect practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next news article discussion which is about using single use plastic waste as an alternative fuel the syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference this news article stresses the importance of using plastic waste as an alternative fuel in the industries like cement industries so before discussing about the news article we should know how much plastic waste is generated in india as per the report of central pollution control board in india about 6 lakh 60 thousand tons of plastic waste is generated per annum that is per year this plastic waste is posing a significant threat to environment as well as it is threat to the health of the public so in this context it becomes important to manage the ever growing plastic waste in india and managing the plastic waste has become a major challenge for us if you see generally there are four important ways to deal with plastic waste they are landfilling recycling biodegradation and incineration here landfilling means simply filling the low lying areas with the generated plastic waste but the simple landfilling is not a sustainable way to manage the problem it's because it further leads to the accumulation of nanoparticles of the plastic into the land and also into such other ecosystems then in case of recycling we know that recycling means giving second life to the plastic waste that is generated this method is important and recommendable but the efficiency of this method depends on the effective way of collection of plastic waste segregation of plastic waste and using the suitable ways to reuse the plastic waste so recycling of single use plastic waste is one of the challenging tasks then the next method is the biodegradation of the plastic waste this method involves application of microorganisms in order to degrade the plastic waste in this method the difficulty is that 
all types of plastic cannot be degraded using the microorganisms. The next comes the method of incineration. This method is now emerging as suitable way to use generated plastic waste. Here incineration in simple term means the combustion of plastic waste in the presence of oxygen at high temperature. Now coming back to the news article discussion, the news article mentions one more method to deal with the plastic waste. The article mentions that single use plastic waste can be suitably used in cement industries as an alternative fuel. The article also also mentions other examples like fly ash and slag which are also used as alternative fuel in industries. In this fly ash means fine powder. It is a byproduct of the burning coal in industries like thermal power plants. And this fly ash can be used in brick making, road laying as a raw material. We will be seeing more about fly ash in one of our discussion today. Then slag is a byproduct in iron and steel industry. The slag contains metal sulfides and elemental metals. The slag is generally used to remove waste in metal smelting. Now similar to fly ash and slag, single use plastic waste can also be used as alternative fuel in cement industry furnaces. It was estimated that the cement industries can reduce their fuel cost by as much as 20 percentage or more by using single use plastics as an alternative fuel source. The news article also mentions that the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs is working with cement industries in this direction. So there shall be a clear policy, then only it would be effective. Therefore, the policy should clearly adopt the challenges like plastic waste collection, plastic waste segregation, its transportation and uh, using plastic waste as a alternative fuel. So this is all about this news article. The split practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article which is about a UNDP report on women's economic empowerment. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. The news article is about a report titled as Corporate Engagement in Women's Economic Empowerment. This report was prepared jointly by the United Nations Development Program India and Samhita. In this United Nations Development Program or UNDP is an arm of United Nations which works in almost 170 countries. The objective of UNDP is to achieve achieve the eradication of poverty and the reduction of inequalities and exclusion. Then this Samhita is a CSR consulting firm. It collaborates with companies to develop impactful corporate social responsibility initiatives. So before discussing about this report, let us first know what is corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility or CSR is the concept that the corporations operating within society are responsible to contribute towards economic, social and environmental development that creates positive impact on society at large. So we can say that the CSR mandates the corporations to contribute towards development of the society. Now this CSR is mentioned in section 135 of the Companies Act of 2013. The CSR provisions are applicable to every company that is having a net worth of rupees 500 crore or more or the company which is having turnover of rupees 1000 crore or more or the company which is having a net profit of rupees 5 crore or more during any financial year. Now the Companies Act of 2013 mandates uh, such companies to spend at least 2 percentage of the average net profits of the company on CSR and this average net profit is the profit which was made during the 3 immediately preceding financial years by that company. The act also provides certain activities which may be included by the companies in their CSR policy. These activities are mentioned in Schedule 7 of the Companies Act of 2013. The activities are eradicating extreme hunger and poverty, then promotion of education, then promoting gender equality and empowering women, then reducing child mortality and improving maternal health etc. So like these many activities are given in this Schedule 7 of the Act. Now let us come back to the news article discussion. Now first you should understand that the report gives insights into the efforts and initiatives of top 100 companies towards the economic empowerment of women. The report also identifies gaps in the company's programs and the report gives recommendations to make India more gender equitable. According to this report, top 100 firms in India spent a mere 4 percentage of their total expenditure on CSR activities and especially on 
women's economic empowerment so what is meant by economic empowerment economic empowerment can be defined as the capacity to participate in and the capacity to contribute to and the capacity to benefit from the growth processes so this economic empowerment helps women to get recognition for their contributions it helps to respect their dignity and it helps to negotiate a fairer distribution of the benefits of growth to women now this simply means that contribution of women will be recognized and they will get their share of benefits of growth under this economic empowerment now based on this the news article discusses certain facts the facts are not relevant for us but the facts show the lack of interest of companies in women's economic empowerment if you see in the financial year 2017 to 18 the top 100 companies spent a total amount of rupees 6314 crore on csr activities and in that about 423 crores was spent on women's empowerment and within this only 250 crores were spent on women's economic empowerment now this amounts to a mere 4 percentage of the total expenditure Now the news article also mentions uh, about the top companies which spent most money. These companies are Hindustan Unilever, then Tata Steel and Ambuja Cement etc. So what are the gaps or the lacunae in economically empowering women? that is mentioned in the report according to the report 72 percentage of the top 100 countries reported intervention in women's economic empowerment but as we have discussed that the amount spent in this sector is very less so there is a huge scope for enhancing the spending and it is also to be noted that states such as bihar jharkhand and assam has very low female labor participation rate so ideally these states require more focus on women's economic empowerment but the report says that these states saw very little csr intervention then another gap which is mentioned in this report is the lack of focus throughout the entire life cycle of women's employment this cycle has three stages one is preparing or uh, skilling women then uh, entering them into the labor market then finally help them to grow and support them to sustain in the field now according to the report most of the companies focused on this prepare and enter stage only they provided career counseling and vocational training etc but in order to grow and sustain women requires digital and financial literacy but there is a lack of support in this context that is women are not getting enough knowledge with respect to digital and financial literacy now this has resulted in women dropping out of their jobs but the report also says that only 31 percentage of the companies focused on all the three stages then another key finding by this report is that women comprised less than and 10 percentage of the permanent workforce in majority of top 100 companies especially this is happening in manufacturing and the automobile sectors because these sectors are historically dominated by male employees now these are the gaps or the lacunae in economically empowering women that is mentioned in the report now let us discuss the recommendations that were given in the report according to the report the companies should go for more comprehensive measures of women empowerment they should try to employ more women in their permanent workforce also the measures should ensure the increased participation of women in leadership roles then another recommendation is that the company should join hands with various stakeholders such as parents spouses and women self help groups to ensure the support in the entire life cycle of women's employment this will also help to provide a conducive ecosystem for women's development so we can say that though csr activities have a good intention of women's empowerment more needs to be done in this sector more csr policies and fundings for women's empowerment along with other inclusive measures will help to develop a really empowered women labor force with this we have come to the end of this news article discussion the split practice question will be discussed in the last session Moving on to the next article discussion which is about the fly ash leakage in the power plant of National Thermal Power Corporation in Madhya Pradesh. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. Before discussing about the news article, let us first discuss about fly ash. So what is this fly ash? Fly ash is a byproduct from burning pulverized coal in electric power generating power plants in this pulverized coal is nothing but crushed coal or powdered coal while burning the pulverized coal 
the mineral impurities in the coal fuse in suspension and they float out of the combustion chamber along with the exhaust gases. The fused material rises, cools and solidifies into a spherical glassy particles which is called as fly ash. This fly ash is collected from the exhaust gases by the help of electrostatic precipitators or bag filters. Now also know that fly ash is a substance which primarily consists of oxides of silicon, aluminium, iron and calcium. So what is the use of this fly ash? Fly ash is used as a key component in cement based products such as uh, cement concretes and concrete blocks and cement based bricks. The fly ash improves the strength in these products. They are also used in manufacturing of tiles. They are used in uh, construction of road embankments, then in uh, development of low-lying areas. Then they are also used in agriculture as soil conditioner. So let us take one example for how fly ash is used as soil conditioner. For this we need alkaline fly ashes. These alkaline fly ashes can be added in large quantities to neutralize the acidity and increase the pH levels associated with acid soils. So in this way fly ash is used as soil conditioner. Then the fly ash also improves soil which has poor physical properties. Here by physical property we mean the texture of the soil then the water holding capacity of the soil etc. But we should also know that there are safety protocols for administering fly ash for various purposes. This is because fly ash contains heavy metals including arsenic, lead, mercury, cadmium and others. Initially we saw that it contains silicon, aluminium, iron and calcium also. Now these heavy metals like arsenic is inhaled or it is drunk or if it is consumed then these toxicants can cause cancer and it can also impact nervous system. This leads to cognitive deficits, developmental delays and behavioral problems. They can also cause heart damage, lung disease, kidney disease, then reproductive problems, birth defects, impaired bone growth in children and also other disturbances to human health. Now today's news is that in Madhya Pradesh in the NTPC plant that is in the National Thermal Power Corporation plant the dike wall storing the fly ash has collapsed. In this dike is a long wall or embankment that is built to prevent flooding from the sea or uh, the nearby river. So this dike wall has collapsed in the NTPC plant in Madhya Pradesh. This power plant is located in Singrauli district of Madhya Pradesh. Now also note that according to NCRT, Singrauli coal field is one among the most important coal mining centers in India. Now according to the news article, the breaking of the dike wall has led to fly ash spillage in the Rihant dam. Now here know that this Rihant reservoir or dam is partly in Madhya Pradesh and partly in Uttar Pradesh. Now because of the spillage whoever is consuming the contaminated water they are at risk because it contains many heavy metals like arsenic, mercury, cadmium etc. Then also as a result of breach of fly ash it has also caused spillage in several acres of nearby land and this spillage can contaminate the nearby land. This is because the heavy metals in the fly ash may leach or drain away when it comes in contact with water and the toxic leachates may run away with water and they will contaminate the land. Now the authorities are saying that the excess rain in the three to four days period is the reason for the collapse of the boundary wall and this collapse has led to the fly ash spillage. But it is said that there was no damage to human life, cattle and farms because of the spillage. A team of uh, pollution control board is visiting the site and they will collect samples and the board may also impose a fine on the plant for environmental damage. Now this topic is very important for examination because there is one previous year question based on fly ash. Take a look at this question and try to attempt this question based on the information which we just discussed now. So with this we have come to the end of this news article discussion. This practice question will be discussed in the last session. This news article is about Mamallapuram. Mamallapuram is important because the second informal summit between India and China is scheduled to be held in this place. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. Before two days, we saw about a discussion based on an editorial written by the former National Security Advisor. In that discussion, we saw that Mamallapuram, which is a part of South India, was ruled by the 
rulers of Pallava dynasty from 275 CE to 897 CE. In that discussion, we also discussed about the earliest recorded security pact between India and China. It was in the early 8th century when the Chinese sought help from the Pallava king Narasimha Verma too. Now today we will see few more information about this place and its speciality. Mamallapuram is also called as Mahabalipuram. This is based on the mythology. However, based on history, this place is named as Mamallapuram as a tribute to the famous Pallava king Narasimha Verman I because he was called as the great wrestler. In this word Mamallapuram, if you see in Tamil, Mal means wrestling. Mallan means a wrestler and Ma Mallan means a great wrestler. So as a tribute to the Pallava king Narasimha Verman I who was a great wrestler, this place was given the name Ma Mallapuram. This place that is the Mahabalipuram or the Ma Mallapuram is in the shore of Bay of Bengal and it is in the south of Chennai. Now from examination point of view, we have to know that the group of monuments in this place is one of the 30 cultural world heritage sites in India. The monuments of Mahabalipuram or the Ma Mallapuram were declared as world heritage sites in the year 1984. If you remember, in many classes we have seen about other world heritage sites also. Let us revise them one by one. One is the Jaipur city in Rajasthan. This is the site which received the world heritage status very recently that is in 2019. Then we also discussed about Jantar Mantar which is in Jaipur and it is also a cultural world heritage site. It was declared as a world heritage site in the year 2010. Then we also discussed about three sites in the name of caves when we discussed about the Adakkal caves and the Ambukutti hills in Kerala. All these three sites in the name of caves are in one state that is the state of Maharashtra. They are the Ellora caves which was declared in 1983 as a world heritage site, then Elephanta caves in 1987, then Ajanta caves in 1983. Then we also discussed about the natural sites which were declared as the world heritage site. In this we saw about western guards which was declared in 2012. Then we saw about great Himalayan national park conservation area which was declared in 2014. Then we also saw about Manas wildlife sanctuary and Kaziranga national park in Assam. And we also saw about one of the site which is declared as world heritage site under the mixed category which is situated in Sikkim that is the Kanjanzonga National Park. So these are the world heritage sites which we have discussed during our analysis in the past days. Now also remember that as we have discussed in many other discussions in India we have 30 cultural world heritage sites and we have 7 natural world heritage sites and we have one mixed site. And today along with these uh, other sites, we will be adding the group of monuments in Mahabalipuram to this list. These group of monuments are founded by the Pallava kings. The monuments can be grouped under four categories. One is rock cut caves, second monolithic structures, third then open air bas relief or open air bar reliefs. Then the fourth one is the structural temples. Now in this open air bas relief or bar relief is a type of art in which shapes are cut from the surrounding stone so that they stand just slightly out against a flat surface as you can see in this picture. In this picture you can see that the actual structures are protruding from the surface or they are or you can say that they are embossed on these stones. Now under the patronage of Pallava kings these monuments were carved out of rock along the Coromandel coast or the east coast in the 7th and 8th centuries. The place is known especially for its radhas. There are five rock cut radhas in the southern end of Mahabalipuram. Collectively these five rock cut radhas are called as five radhas. Here when we say radhas we are referring to the temples that are in the form of chariots as you can see in this picture. Then Mahabalipuram is also known for mandapas which are rock cut cave sanctuaries. We can also see giant open air bar reliefs. For example, uh, one of the famous open air relief is the descent of the Ganges. 
Now, this uh, descent of the Ganges is also called as Arjuna's penance. It is called so because of the story from Mahabharata. The story is that Arjuna carried out certain divine prayers or austerities to gain some powers of Lord Shiva. And the name descent of the Ganges is given because of the artwork in this relief. The artwork in a kind narrates the story of the descent of the river Ganges to earth from the heaven. Now, along with these, there is also a famous shore temple in Mahabalipuram. This famous shore temple is also called as the temple of Revage because Revage in French means shore or beach. This shore temple has three structural temples and many sculptures which depicts the glory of Lord Shiva. Now, this shore temple is also called as the land of seven pagodas. It is called so because of the belief that once there were six other great structures or temples along with the present day shore temple. Now, here note that pagoda means Hindu or a Buddhist temple. So, as a whole we can say that the monuments here are living examples of the artwork of rock cut architecture by the Pallava rulers. Then some historians are saying that Mamallaburam has once served as an active port with extensive trade with Rome and other places at least from 1st century CE. Then also know that the group of monuments in Mamalaburam are also protected as the protected monuments or sites under the Archaeological Survey of India. Then also remember that in 2017 the Mahabalipuram stone sculpture this has received the GI tag status under the category handicrafts. It is because the stone sculpture techniques that are used in the historic pieces of artwork of 7th and 8th centuries are still practiced by the present day sculptors of Mamalapuram. That is why they are given the GI tag status and we can say that their sculpting is reminiscent of the Pallava art of stone sculpting. Reminiscent means reminding something. So, the sculpting by the present day sculptors of Mamalapuram reminds about the stone sculpting in the Pallava period. So, these are the information which you you should know about this Mahabalipuram or Mamalaburam, which is relevant to our examination. Then most probably if the Chinese president comes to this place by October 11, then by next year we all may be revising about the Mamalaburam spirit in Sino-Indian relations just as we study about the Wuhan spirit these days. So with this we come to the end of this news article discussion. The split practice question will be discussed in the last session. We have come to the last session for the day that is the practice questions discussion session. This first question is based on automatic exchange of information. In this the first statement states it is an agreement that provides for the exchange of non-resident financial account information with the tax authorities in the account holders country of residence. First it is an agreement yes it is correct then yes it is an exchange of uh, non-resident financial account information this is also correct then yes this account information is exchanged with the tax authorities. This is also correct and the information is exchanged with the account holders country of residence. It is also correct. So, this statement as a whole is correct. We have discussed this in detail during our discussion. The second statement states India has signed this agreement with all the P5 countries. Now, to answer this question first you should know what are the P5 countries. In this P5 stands for the five permanent members of United Nations Security Council. So, who are the permanent members of UNSC? One is China, then France, then Russia, then United Kingdom, then United States. Now, actually India has signed this agreement with 56 countries, but India has not signed this agreement with United States, which means India has not signed this agreement with all the P5 countries. So, this statement becomes a wrong statement. Here the question asks for the correct statements. So, the final correct answer to this question is option A, 1 only. Now, this question is based on corporate social responsibility. The first statement is it was enacted under the Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises Development Act of 2006. Now, this is wrong because CSR was enacted under the section 135 of Companies Act of 2013 and not under the MSME Act of 2006. So, this statement is wrong. The second statement states the eligible companies have to spend at least 3 percentage of their average net profits made during the 
3 immediately preceding financial years. Now, the second half of the statement is correct. The average net profits which were made during the 3 immediately preceding financial years is correct. But how much percentage of this average net profit? It is 2 percentage and not 3 percentage. So, this statement is also wrong. Now, carefully you have to see that the question asks for the correct statements. Here, neither first statement is correct and nor the second statement. So, the correct answer to this question is neither 1 nor 2. In this question, two statements are given and we have to choose the correct statement. The first statement states, National Thermal Power Corporation Limited is a Maharatna Central Public Sector Enterprise. Now, this first statement is correct. NTPC became a Maharatna company in May 2010 and even now it is in the same status. We had a detailed discussion about the schemes of Maharatna, Mini Ratna and Navratna during our analysis on September 24, 2019. The link for the analysis is given in the description box. Please have a look at it. Now also know that at present there are only 8 Maharatnas, 16 Navratnas and some 61 Mini Ratna category 1 CPSCs and 12 under Mini Ratna category 2 CPSCs. Now, for the exam purposes, you may just note only the Maharatna CPSCs and the criteria for conferring of such status. The 8 Maharatna Central Public Enterprises are Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited, then Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited, then Coal India Limited, then Gale India Limited, then Indian Oil Corporation Limited, then NTPC Limited, then Oil and Natural Gas Corporation Limited, then finally Steel Authority of India Limited. So, this statement is correct. Now, the second statement states fly ash can be used as a soil conditioner in agriculture. Now, this statement is also correct. During discussion, we saw an example based on this statement and we also saw that fly ash can also improve soils that have uh, poor physical properties like uh, poor texture of soil or low water holding capacity etc. Here both the statements are correct and the question asks for the correct statement. So, the final correct answer to this question is option C both 1 and 2. Now, this question is based on world heritage sites in natural sites category. Here four options are given Western Guards, Jaipur City, groups of monuments at Mahabalipuram, Manas Wildlife Sanctuary. Now, remember that all these four are world heritage sites. In this question, we have to say which are the sites which have been given world heritage site status under natural sites category. Now, here you can use a simple trick because under the natural sites category, normally forest areas, then national parks, then uh, wildlife sanctuaries, then some conservation areas are listed. So, in this you can easily say that Jaipur city is not a national park or a wildlife sanctuary and also group of monuments at Mahabalipuram does not have a national park or a wildlife sanctuary or any conservation area. So, by this you can easily eliminate 2 and 3 and if you see in the options 1 and 4 is given together. So, the final correct answer to this question is option D 1 and 4. Also remember that in India there are 7 natural world heritage sites and these two are cultural sites. Now, let us see one mains question based on GS3. Use of single plastic waste as an alternative fuel may reduce fuel costs by about 20 percentage in cement industries. In the light of the above statement, suggest different measures to deal with growing plastic waste generation in India. Now, to answer this question, you can uh, begin with by giving justification to the statement that is given here. You can say that based on research reports and also based on international case study, it was estimated that about 20 percentage of fuel cost can be saved if plastic waste is used as an alternative source. Then you can also mention how much plastic waste is generated per annum and why it needed attention like we discussed during the analysis. Then you can give the alternative measures like how generated plastic waste can be dealt with. You can mention the measures like land filling, recycling, biodegradation, incineration, etc. We have discussed all these measures in detail during our discussion. Then you can finally conclude the answer like uh, framing of a suitable policy as soon as possible and the implementation of the policy will be effective in this direction. 
with this we have come to the end of today's Hindu news analysis if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation